Marco Evangelisti, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you, Howard, for having me. Yeah, so um, I wanted to talk to you because you have pointed out to me a huge gap in my efforts to be a good person on this earth. And of course, it's, it's painful to see that. Uh, but th you also present some pretty straightforward, easy ways for remedying it. So it felt, it felt okay um, starting to look at this and starting to, to make some changes. Um, and specifically, I'm talking about investing money. And my thought was, well, I'm a good person. I do good work in the world. I'm kind to others. And I'm just going to take whatever money I have and just, let, you know, not pay any attention to it. I'm not into money. I don't care about it. And look, when I get a statement from my bank, it kind of either bores me or scares me. And I'll just put it in mutual funds, let the experts take care of it, and I'll just go about my life. And you convinced me that that's a, a highly irresponsible thing to do if I care about a living planet. Uh, so with, with that introduction, I want, I want to welcome you and say, like, I, I want to kind of explore, you know, how you came to this perspective and what we can do once we embrace it as well. So, so welcome. Right, well, first of all, let me say, sorry if I made you feel like that. Yeah. Uh, one thing I was trying to convey during our conversation last Friday is that we're part of a system that makes us do things that might be counterproductive in the long run. So people shouldn't feel bad for what they're doing right now because it's actually challenging to change the way we do things, especially relating to investing. Yeah, and well, I can also relate to what you're saying about the fact that money is a little bit of an abstract concept and people either are scared uh, about it and prefer not to look at it or uh, they get uh, over their head very quickly and they think the experts you know, know how to deal with investments and so on. So uh, what I want to convey is that uh, people shouldn't feel bad after hearing our conversation. And all we're trying to do is really bring that area of their life into awareness. Yeah. That's well, a great first step. Well, for me, it was so, like touching the hot stove. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, like I felt bad in that way. <laughs> right, right, right. So uh, I, I can tell a little bit my story uh, that for, yes, probably but... can put this thing in, in uh, context. So, you know, I was a math major and I studied finance in college. And then I was so fortunate to get a job in a consulting company that was developing quantitative models for uh, the quants in Wall Street. This was like in the late 80s, very early mm -hmm. on you know, before people had computers on their desks, uh, at least most of, of people in, in offices. And it was an exciting time. And uh, um, eventually I ended up working for one of those clients that we were serving at the time. And they were a very well run and ethically managed investment management firm. It was a boutique firm that was uh, working primarily with endowments and foundations. And I was part of a team that was managing $20 billion in emerging markets equities. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we were say managing emerging, money. Emer emerging markets, what does that mean? Emerging markets is a term that refers to countries that are not considered fully developed. Example are, you know, Turkey, um, South Korea, Brazil, uh, China even is, uh -huh. is uh, considered part of the emerging markets. Uh, uh, Thailand, um, some African countries like Egypt and so on. So basically- So sort of like huge opportunity and yet more risk or more unknowns. Exactly. So that's kind of a, if you think about the late eighties, that was a new area to get into, like, you know, let's invest in these countries that have not yet fully developed, but that mm -hmm. might offer opportunities and so on. So uh, I was part of a team that was managing $20 billion in that space. And we were quants, we developed quantitative models, we programmed, you know, all these computers to look at fundamental data and market data and so on. And that would spit out a set of trades that then we would execute. And we were really good at developing quantitative models because our fund was the best performing fund in emerging markets equities with a 10 year track record. And it was very easy job for me because I was 
client, you know, part of the management team, but facing the clients and the clients loved us. You know, Correct. we were generating amazing returns uh, and a lot of our clients were um, foundations, endowments and so on. And at a certain point, I asked myself, wait a second, how do we generate a 40% return last year? You know, and, and 40 was 13% higher than our index, our benchmark, what we were supposed to outperform. And for the people that know finance, a $20 billion unleveraged fund delivering you know, an outperformance of 13% is crazy. It's, it's really amazing. <laughs> And uh, I remember looking at the best performing stocks in our portfolio and was a palm oil company in Malaysia that had destroyed tens of thousands of acres of rainforest in the Borneo and planted palm oil trees, so a monocrop. And in fact, part of the reason why they did very well that year is they got a lot of carbon credits because they were planting trees. <laughs> and I was shocked, I was shocked because I said, wait a second, we are managing money of environmental foundations and we're investing in a company that is destroying the habitat of the orangutan. In other words, we're investing in a way that is completely contrary to what those foundations are trying to do. Some of those foundations were trying to protect the habitat of the orangutan, for God's sake, right? And here we are, you know, in our professional capacity. I even donated personally to those uh, foundations and, and I was founding myself finding myself in my professional capacity, investing on behalf of those foundations to destroy the very habitat of the orangutan that those foundations were created to protect. And that was my kind of come to Jesus moment, if you want. And I said, what the heck are we doing here collectively? And I remember even having a conversation with the chief investment officer of one of those foundations. And I said, you know, this is what I found. I mean, we're investing on your behalf in a company that has destroyed the habitat of the orangutan in, in the Borneo, in the island of Borneo. You know, are, are you not concerned? And, you know, he hesitated a little bit. Uh, that's a tough question. I could have been fired for asking that question. But he basically said, you know, my job is to protect the assets of the foundations in perpetuity. Again, a luxury we do not afford the 10,000-year-old rainforest. And then he said, I need to generate a return to pay for the operations of the foundations and its many wonderful programs. And I did my job perfectly because I picked you guys and you're the best in town, mm. right? So here we are, right? We're part of the system. And I'm sure, I mean, this guy has joined, had joined a, an environmental foundation. He, of course, learned finance and so on, but he was probably very interested in helping preserve the natural environment. I was a passionate environmentalist, right? But at the end of the day, after just a little bit of digging, what I found is that I was complicit in the destruction of the forest and so on. Uh, and so that's when I, you know, stepped back, left my job and developed, uh, you know, essential knowledge for transition, which is, you know, my company, which is basically trying to teach regular folks how those large systems work. So to get back to your question, uh, you know, I'm sorry I made you feel bad about your investments, but, uh, you know, it's so easy and common for people to say, look, I'm busy. Uh, I'm passionate about X. I don't care about money that much. I have some. I need to protect it. I need to grow it. I'm going to give it to a financial advisor. A financial advisor will say, oh, well, diversified portfolio, bonds and stocks, and you're good. Uh, and I think we are at a point where we need to recognize that the investments we make are shaping the world we're living in. And if we're looking around and realizing that we don't like the directions in which the world and society are heading, whether that mm. is global warming, social instability, concentration of wealth, you know, and all those other problems we're facing, we have to look at our portfolio and say, are any of our investments actually causing or participating right. in this damage? Right. And so that's, that's the, the task for us, which is, which is a hard task because, you know, it requires us to take 
responsibility for our agency in the world expressed through our investments. Yeah. Well, so I I did that a couple of times. Like I looked at the companies that were in different, you know, mutual funds and portfolios or and I I would look for things that said like, you know, cigarette maker or weapons maker or um, you know, they, they sew hoods for the Ku Klux Klan or something. Like, like right. there was nothing obviously bad. I'm like, oh, okay. So there was, you know, there's Goldman Sachs and Citigroup. And of course, I, you know, I use like, you know, Chase and City credit cards. It's just things like, well, this is, this is the world. You told the story about a mutual fund um, that had uh, Cisco foods right. in it, right? Can you like help? Yeah, help sure. And, you know, like, just think about, I mean, if we just think about the financial institutions, you know, um, the industry and people have expressed this desire to uh, pay attention to what their investments are doing. And that's why this whole socially responsible investing movement has started that there are all these funds now doing screens and so on and trying to kick out the worst offenders. Uh, but just keep in mind that a lot of those funds have financial institutions like JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America, and so on. And those large banks have funded, um, you know, fossil fuel projects, including pipeline, you know, uh, oil pipeline and, and uh, tar sand extraction and so on, at the tune of close to $2 trillion since the signing of the Paris Accord. So in other words, if you have those large financial institutions, you're in part funding, you know, those those projects and but I'll tell the story of the Cisco Cisco is well known as a large uh, distributor of um, food it's a major food distributor and logistics company and I remember attending a couple of years ago at the Grass Valley Film Festival uh, which is really fun it's for activists in California and uh, they showed this movie called the uh, Ghost Fleet which is gut-wrenching is the story of slave labor in this uh, illegal fishing fleets in Indonesia and Thailand. And people get kidnapped and brought on the ships and they never see the land again. Mm. And they're treated in horrendous conditions. They're given uh, you know, amphetamines to keep working long hours. When they die, they toss them all overboard. And then there are these other vessels come in and take, take the catch. So those ships are out there and never come back. Mm. And, you know, it's just a horrendous story. Now, as a result of that, people have done a little bit of digging and found out that a lot of those fleets were in the supply chain of Cisco. And to its credit, Cisco realized, oh, well, we need to correct that. And so they uh, addressed their, their issue on their supply chain. But this is to say that Cisco, until that point, and in fact, may still be in many socially responsible funds, right? And, and it is that how many other Cisco's or, I don't know, company using slave labor or using prison labor or, right? I mean, it's very hard for, for us to know what those investments and large corporations are doing out there. But again, people shouldn't feel bad <laughs> uh, necessarily as long as they get a curiosity about looking into it and say, you know, maybe we should take a look at that. And that's why, you know, this idea of aware investing, which is one of the things that I'm trying to help people with, just becoming aware of what you're investing in. Just know. Uh, I, think, I think at this point, it's the times are almost demanding of us that we do that. And I remember, you know, I was crossing the street and there was this distracted driver that almost mowed me down. And, uh, and you know, I was really scared. And I said, you know, pay attention. What, what the heck is going on? And, and she said, she was uh, driving this thing. I said, you know, I didn't do it on purpose. Mm. As if not knowing what you're doing it exculpates you from the consequences of your actions. I mean, it's like, I think even if you didn't do it on purpose, if you had killed me, that would be manslaughter. <laughs> You know, yeah. okay, it's not first degree murder, it's not even second or third, but you're still going to be responsible <laughs> for any yeah. guilty because it's your car doing it. And so to a certain extent, I think we might want to get to the place where we say, okay, we need to look at our investments because we're acting in the world through them. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, do we yeah. know what we're doing out there? So yeah. that's basically the, the, the basic. Yeah. Kind of thing. Well, I'm, and I'm hearing echoes of this story and a lot of the people who listen to this podcast are vegans or become ethical vegans and they all had a moment where they really, you know, they had a, a sense of, oh, what I'm doing isn't in accord with my values. Like they just, you know, they watch a, a documentary about factory farming or, or something. And there's a great, you know, there's this great well of, oh, I didn't know. And now that I know I have to change because I'm not living in accordance with my values. And that's, that was the experience I got um, looking at your website and watching your recorded webinar. And then the one you did live is that, okay, so it was, you know, it's much easier for, for vegans to forget about it, to just pretend I did not see that, I didn't go to the, sanctuary, the farm sanctuary, I don't know anything, because the world is a conveyor belt feeding me animal products and very, very, and the world, the financial world is a conveyor belt giving me mutual funds that I don't have to think about. And, and it's, it's, you know, the, the dogma in the industry is if you don't want to pay attention, if you don't want to spend a lot of time, put your money in mutual funds because nobody ever outperforms the market. Right. And, and, and so, and, you know, kind of you're digging into it and saying, well, these mutual funds are actually funding. They are the main engine. The, the markets are the main engine affecting the world. And I really hadn't thought about it that the, like the world is funded by someone and it's markets. Right. And, you know, and to a certain extent, I so much appreciate your audience who cares about the world so much so that they change their eating habits. Yeah. And I'm sure that is inconvenient, right? <laughs> I mean, it's like the, the uh, pinnacle of convenience is a TV dinner <laughs> that you buy for a couple of bucks. You slot into the, uh, the micro oven and you eat it and you don't even have to wash dishes. I mean, that's like the pinnacle of convenience. And I think that the whole food system, you know, the industrial food system has been set up to make it really convenient and cheap for, for us to feed ourselves. The, the, the flip side is that it's making us sick. In fact, there is this fascinating statistic I saw, and I might be off by a percentage point because I, I can't remember exactly, but I think in the, in the 60s, we were paying 17% of our disposable income in food and 9% in healthcare. Hmm. Now we're paying 18% of our disposable income in healthcare and 9% to feed ourselves. Huh. So in other words, we got cheap food, but now we're paying the same amount of money in total, but just we're paying it in healthcare as opposed to paying it for better food, right? And I would say the finance industry similarly has made it really easy for us not to think about our investments, make it really easy. You know, mutual funds or mutual funds are up, there was zoo or do an index fund. You don't even think about it. You just match the market and that's it, right? Mm -hmm. Super convenient. Uh, we're not thinking about it. And I think it's making us sick, but it's making us sick uh, on a collective way by uh, destroying the ecosystems, by polluting the air, by cr creating social tension, and so on. And so, again, what is the inconvenient thing that could be good for our health is to look into our portfolio and figure out if we want to be participating in those things. Exactly like the uh, recommendation now for a healthy lifestyle is to say, okay, stop buying processed food and once a week go to the farmer's market buy your veggies, learn a new recipe, and invite a few friends over for dinner. Although now with COVID, that's yeah. a little bit hard. But you see what I mean? It's like the inconvenient thing is actually the one that would improve our health and our mental health too at the end of the day. So. All right. So, um, so I'm still coming up with objections because part of me really doesn't want to listen to you, right? Part no. of me oh, really, yeah. wishes, wishes that. So one thing I'm thinking is like, okay, so mutual funds, there could be a thousand different stocks in a mutual fund. I don't know what's in there, but let's say like a company like Apple, which I like, I kind of, I understand what they do. And I have an iPhone. I have like my computers are Macs. So I'm, I'm supporting them with my money as a consumer. Wouldn't, isn't it hypocritical for me then to say, well, I don't want to invest 
in Apple? Because like maybe they're using, um, you know, they're uh, so destroying it, rainforests. Uh, great. So the, the example of Apple is great because if you're investing in the stock of Apple, you are actually at the next level of awareness in terms of investing. And I have kind of this various levels. The, the main level is unaware and possibly extractive, right? So, I mean, you are in mutual funds, you don't know what is in there. And maybe, you know, those companies are behaving or not. Chances are they're not because that's mm -hmm. they're designed to maximize profit. So when, when you say extractive, can you define that? Extractive is somebody else is paying for your returns or if you're a company, somebody else is paying for your earnings. So, for example, if a company pollutes and doesn't have to put the scrubbers to reduce the CO2 emission, right, their profits mm -hmm. are going to be higher because they don't have to pay to clean up, up after themselves. Mm -hmm. So their earnings are going to be greater, but somebody else is paying for that. Who's paying for that? The people that are getting sick, breathing the air. Or, right? So mm -hmm. that's, that's the idea of extraction is you're externalizing costs or you are appropriating a common or destroying a common in the process of creating an economic benefit for you or your shareholders. Well, that, that sounds an awful lot like, like theft. It is. At the end of the day, I mean, the fascinating thing about <laughs> how much of capitalism is based on theft, whether it's the, you know, the, the labor uh, of the black people we, we took to this country as slaves. But, you know, maybe that's a little bit too much to get into. But um, what I wanted to say is the case of Apple, right? So the, the unaware, possibly extractive, is where most of our investments are at this point. The next step, which is I'm suggesting, is aware. And just by virtue of the fact that you know you bought the stock of Apple, you're now aware. You know where your money is, mm. right? Perfect. Uh -huh. Now, the question is, do you feel good about investing in Apple or not? And somebody could say, like you said, hey, I have a phone. I have a, a laptop of Apple. They do great products. I use them. It would be, um, as you say, um, not completely logical to say, hey, I'm willing to buy the products, but I'm not going to invest in them. So, you know, for some people, Apple would be a no harm investment because they say, hey, they make phones. I use phones. You know, that's fine. And there will be no judgment about that. People say, I use Apple product. I invest in Apple. Great. Now, some people might be concerned about labor conditions. You know, they might think about Foxconn that produces all those phones and, you know, people are jumping off the windows and killing themselves because the conditions are so horrendous. Now, they might have improved that a little bit. Mm. But some people might say, I recognize that because of that, I don't want to participate and benefit economically from it. And they could simply, they could still say, but I like their phones, I'm going to buy the phones, you know, but I'm not, uh, I'm not willing to benefit financially mm. from the operation of Apple. And that's a decision that people would make on their own. The, the, let me give you another example, which is uh, classic, right? Uh, if you invest in a treasury bond of the United States, Right. Or a treasury bill, right? You're buying the debt of the government. Okay, that's aware. So you know where your money is. Is it no harm or not? And that's depending, uh, depends on your point of view. We're spending, you know, the, the US government is spending half of the disposable income on military spending. If that, if you believe that that is to protect us, United States, you know, and without that, somebody would, be, would invade us and take over the United States, then that's no harm. We are trying to defend ourselves. If you're thinking about the fact that we have bases in 150 countries that are involved in wars all over the place, and a lot of them are wars of choice, then maybe you can say, hey, I, I think that's actually a harming thing. I'm, I'm you know, providing this capital to the government and half of it, yes, goes to programs and pensions and so on, but half of it goes to war. So uh, that's basically a, a determination that it, each individual would have to make. Uh, I want to just give a, an example of investments that I think are acce accessible mostly, uh, you know, sometimes through mutual funds, but le let's think about uh, municipal bonds. Okay. Or well, even state bonds. You know, a lot of states are issuing bonds. I'm sure North Carolina is issuing 
bond. And they mm. usually do that to, you know, fund certain programs. In fact, sometimes the bonds are actually, the, the, are attached to a particular project, you know, redo a road, you know, build some schools, upgrade the parks, whatever it is. That is an aware and no harm investment. Mm. Because, you know, when municipalities and states raise money, it's usually to do stuff that is helping people, not killing them. Mm -hmm. So that's another example. And again, you know, um, we don't want to have perfection be the enemy of the good. And if you're saying, look, uh, I have a financial advisor, I don't want to deal with this. Uh, I'll ask the financial advisor to put me in social responsible fund. Great. It's already a good step, you know, mm -hmm. especially if those are mutual funds that do shareholder activism and vote and hold, mm -hmm. you know, the board to account and try to get yeah. boards more representative or treat workers a little bit better mm -hmm. or, or assess the yeah. risk of their operations. And so, so yeah, so about that. So like, I think I may have seen like Hollywood movies where someone like buys a share of something and then that gives them the right to go to the shareholders meeting. Like, is that a, is that a reasonable thing to do to say, well, like, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I have a share of Cisco and I just found out about uh, this, this documentary about slavery. And so I'm going to go and try to change their policies and be very vocal about it. Or if I'm if like, you know, do I want to have like, what is it responsible in your opinion to have to try to have that kind of leverage? Or would you would you rather just wash your hands? Because if it's not Apple, it's it's Hawaii, right. you know, Hawaii it's it's uh, right. it's it's Android. It's, it's some company that's probably not doing very good things either. Yeah. I mean, the main problem we have is that with the stock market, we have diffused and unengaged owners, right? We all mm -hmm. own, we're part owner of Apple and so on if we, if we own a mutual fund, yet we are unengaged, uninvolved, and so what happens is that we're not taking responsibility for our ownership. I mean, I would imagine that if you own, if you own a small manufacturing, uh, let's imagine you're in North Carolina and you provided some capital and you're an equity investor in a small firm that makes uh, cotton t-shirts with cotton grown in North Carolina, right? right. Uh -huh. If you find out that they start polluting the rivers, you as an owner, you'll say, hey, what, what's going on here? I want to know. I think we need to rectify this mm -hmm. because you know what's going on and you're involved in it. Now, as, as a member, of, you know, as, a, as an investor, you own stocks in all these companies and you don't know what's going on. You're uninvolved. So the ownership is diffused and, and uh, absent. And I think the idea of the shareholder activism is to say, no, no, we own the company and we want to have a say as to what's going on. The best way to deal with that is usually to do a little syndicate. And there is a nonprofit organization that is doing amazing work in this field, which is called the As You Saw Foundation. So it's like sowing the seeds. Uh, mm -hmm. Asyousaw.org. By the way, on their website, they have an amazing tool to screen and understand uh, what your mutual funds contain according to various lenses. Uh, mm -hmm. For example... Uh, fossil fuels, gender equality, prison labor, and so on. And so you can actually type in the name of your fund and find out, you know, what naughty stuff they're doing, right? But what they do is they actually uh, syndicate shareholder activism initiatives whereby they, for example, would say, okay, we want to do an action with, uh, let's say, General Mills, because they are buying grains that have been flooded with glyphosate just before the harvest because that boosts the yield a little bit, but glyphosate is really bad for us. Mm -hmm. uh, how many people have shares in uh, General Mills that would like to join our shareholder activism uh, proposition to say, you know, kick out, you know, don't buy the grain that has been harvested that way because it's toxic to your consumers and you're going to kill them. Hmm. Uh, so then, you know, you are part of a larger action. And if you have, let's say, you know, 100,000 shares of something behind a proposition, it's harder for the management to say to dismiss it. 
Mm -hmm. You know, so it might not, not might not be feasible to do it as a single person owning 100 shares of Apple, let's say. But if you join up with uh, other shareholders, and this is coordinated by, for example, as you saw, foundation, you can really um, have you know make make uh, change mm -hmm. up there. Cool, cool. Now I understand. So if I have a mutual fund, I may have thousands of different stocks. So I obviously can't do that with all of them. Um, so you said there's the, you know, the unaware and possibly extractive or theft based uh, right. investing. There's aware where you know what the company is. And if you choose to, you can find out sort of more or less about what they're doing and decide if it's in accordance with your values. But you go much, much higher than that. Right. What's what's oh, the next yes. level? So uh, you you can go as high as you want. And in fact, uh, I don't know if I can mention I I have a course that I will be teaching. I, I hope I hope you do because I'm I'm planning on taking it. So I, I oh, would great. love to. I, I would love There's to. already an amazing group of people. Uh, so I'm teaching a course in September online called uh, Towards Aware and No Harm Investing to explore these themes with a group of amazing people really that are deciding we have to do something. Uh, about the world and about society and what we can really change without waiting for government petitions or elections and so on is our own investments. And how do we do that? And do that as part of a learning community. Uh, so we are going to explore that. So what is the problem with finance right now? Uh, what does it mean to move to aware, no harm investing? What are the options out there, right? And so it is a continuum and, you know, people can take baby steps in that direction. And I would say the first baby step, of course, is to say, let's go to social responsible funds. But then if you're ready to take the next step, you know, there are other things and we'll talk about a number of investments that are impact investments. So the, the, the next step after no harm is impact investment. And the way I define impact investment is in no harm investment, so you know it's not doing any harm, right? You're aware of it. And it's addressing either a social or environmental problem out there. But it still has a positive risk adjusted return. So it's an actual investment. Uh, on, on average, you're gonna get your capital back and a return. The return might be a little bit smaller, let's say, because part of it is concessionary and you're trying to address you mm -hmm. know, the idea of doing good while doing well and getting market rate return, I think it's, BS, frankly, because a lot of the returns are attractive. So it's very hard to do good out in the, in the world so, if you so, want the same level of return that is predicated on extractions and on the destruction of the natural environment, right? Yeah, so, so it's like, like if, I, you, if I go out, uh, you know, berry picking at my local um, farm stand and I just come back with this thing of berries and I'm sad because I didn't also mug the other people who were picking right. berries. <laughs> Right. So I kind, of, I kind of think like like the baseline should be this impact investing. And then if you are making the stock market returns, it's because there's something extractive going on. Yeah. And by the way, you know, we'll talk also about the markets because I, you know, I think where we are right now, the idea that markets will deliver from where they are right now, their, you know, assume six, seven, eight percent return is uh, chimeric. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's fantasy right now well, because let's, it's been let's, manipulated let's, yeah. massively by the Federal Reserve and all other maneuvers. Let's, but let's, can we talk about that a little bit? Because I, I don't really understand it. And I've been, I've been watching, so, you know, you had a, a slide in your presentation about uh, P&E ratios and ahistorical anomalies. I've been listening to Chris Martinson and Adam Taggart of Peak Prosperity. And I got to say, I don't quite understand and when I talk to financial advisors or people in the know, most of them are saying, oh, no, the stock market is resilient. Yes, it has good days and bad days. But if you're smart and you're, you're investing for the long term, just stay in it. Everything will be fine. The rate of return. So what, what do you see you know, for the layperson like me? What are you seeing now that says that staying in the current stock market the, might be as big a risk as, or more of a risk than doing something outside of it? Well, again, and I'm not a financial advisor and people that would tell you the market is going to crash in a week or a month or six months are usually charlatans, charlatans, <laughs> whatever, uh, however you say it. Now, they might be right. One of them, right, is going to be right. And then people say, oh, my goodness, he called it. Sure. Uh, but I, I just look at history 
And uh, I want to explain this idea of the PE ratio to uh, your audience, and even though it might be a little bit technical. But at the end of the day, uh, the idea is that a company is worth something because it has earnings or is, it expects to have earnings. If a company will never generate earnings in its entire life, I don't think anybody would want to own it, right? So it is really the earnings that drives the value of a company. And there is this uh, idea in, uh, in finance that, you know, if you have a company that is traded on the stock market, there should be a relationship between its earnings potential and what people are paying for that company. And so that ratio is P to E, price to earnings. In other words, how much are willing investors willing to pay for a dollar of earnings in that company? And you can imagine that if people are willing to pay 20 times earnings, right, it's either because they think the company can grow a lot, their earnings, or they might be diluted and they might be, you know, overpaying for that. Vice versa, if a stock is trading at five times earnings, so people are only willing to pay $1, $5 for a dollar of earnings, then you, know, you could either say, well, this is a company that's gonna grow very little over time or might be having some challenges, right? Or it might be cheap. Mm -hmm. Now, on aggregate, if you look at the S&P 500, it has historically traded at 14 times price to earnings. So in other words, historically, uh, market as a whole and market participants have been willing to pay 14 times earnings for the average stock in the S&P. And does right that, now, does, does that equate to like a 7% ish return on investment? Is that, is, is that, no, like, can, well, you, just, you, can you, you divide it? Yeah, you can't quite do that. But uh, uh, typically, so what you see is that typically, if you look at periods when the S&P was trading at 14 times, it has tended to deliver in the next 10 years between six and 8% return. In other words, mm -hmm. if, uh, stocks are fairly valued, let's say, they're not too expensive, not too cheap, they are poised to deliver a decent return. And okay. that 6 to 8% return is what all financial advisors kind of have in mind when they think about what is the expected mm -hmm. return of the market. The reality is that this market has been manipulated a lot since the crash in 2007, 2008, and I don't have to get into, you know, I can't get into the detail of, of how that happened. But basically, uh, before the COVID thing, uh, I think the price to earnings ratio was around 18, 19, which is kind of expensive. Mm -hmm. And then COVID happened, the market dropped like a rock. And actually, when it stopped dropping, it was kind of fairly priced. It was about 14 times earning at that Point. So in other words, it reached fair valuation relative to its long-term history. And then mm -hmm. the Federal Reserve intervened, injected a lot of liquidity into the market, and that skyrocketed back. Now it's 21 times earnings. Now, here's one thing I know. If you look at the whole history of the S&P in the last 100 years, and you find out when was it trading at 20, 21 times earnings, right? So mm -hmm. imagine all those points. Historically, there are not that many when it was trading at 21 times earnings. You look out 10 years, there is no period of 10 years starting from a 20 to 21 P ratio where the 10 year return was positive. There are no 10 years period where if you started investing when the market was as expensive as it is now, that you would have gotten any return out of your investments, that you would not have lost money in the next 10 years. So that's basically what I'm looking at, is like it, it, it matters whether you're buying things very expensively or very cheaply. And if they're fairly priced, yes, the stock market historically has delivered between six and 8%. But if you buy them when they're super, super expensive, we haven't seen a 10 year period following that when people have experienced a positive return, let alone keeping up with, with uh, inflation. So 
that's 10 years, right? So we don't know what's going to happen next year. We don't know what's going to happen in the next three months. I mean, the Federal Reserve could inject another $3 trillion and pump and, the stock And when up. you say inject, they're just printing money? Uh, so it's, you know, printing money. You, what you need to understand is that when the Federal Reserve buys something, it creates the money to buy that. And usually it's not paper money. It's electronic money. It's federal fund reserves. Mm -hmm. So the Federal Reserve, uh, uh, Reserve buys, you know, uh, billions of dollars of mortgage-backed securities from the banks. It just creates the money to buy them. And so you can imagine that if you have a buyer in the market that has unlimited spending power to buy securities, they can manipulate the price, right? I mean, it's like, in fact, there are some laws that say you can sell a stock and then buying it, you know, to boost up the price so that you can sell it at, a, you know, it's like market manipulation is, is known and it's forbidden. Yet it is not if you're the Federal Reserve. And by the way, you can create trillion dollars of money, electronic money to intervene in the markets and buy those security. So that's where we are. Gotcha. Okay, so, um, so that's the sort of impact investing where you can still expect a positive return. And you're saying that compared to the sort of historically where we are right now with the market, any return or even zero return might be better than what, we, what we're gonna see over the next 10 years. But there's, there's another, there's a couple more levels that you talk about. You had a... Um, well, there's um, one more, uh, one more level and that's what I call regenerative investing. And, and here's the funny thing. It's like a lot of the people that are listening to this have a budget for charity, right? So they have, you know, whatever, 1% of their income, whatever they decide every year, then they give it to charity. And it could be the organic uh, producer, whatever, right? So, I mean, they donate to the opera or to the symphony or to whatever they want, right? So if you think in terms of, investment returns out of those charitable, charitable dollars, we're talking about minus 100% return, right? right? So if you think of your charity donation as an investment from a financial standpoint, you lost it all. It's a <laughs> minus 100% return, right? You don't think of it in those terms and you say, no, but I'm just supporting this cause. Then if they want to invest, they want, it, they want to maintain the capital and grow it. So it has to be, the return has to be greater than 0%. So here we go. We have some money that we give to something that has a minus 100% return. And then all the rest has to be zero or above. You know, it's either in our checking account or it has to earn more money. What is in between that minus 100% and zero? And my argument is that there are a number of investments out there they are truly regenerative. They're trying to fix the problem that extractive capitalism has created, which are investments, let's imagine, in a, in a small business in your community, for example. Or an example that I like, because it's accessible to everybody, is Kiva makes zero interest loans and, you know, and asks people to chip in 15% to maintain the platform. So if you think of Kiva, Right? It's kind of a hybrid between an investment and charity because you're donating 15% to the platform. The rest of the money goes out as a zero interest loan to entrepreneurs, usually minority entrepreneurs that have access to uh, accessing capital. And 97% of them will repay your money and the money will come back. Right? So that is an example of regenerative investing, which is you're aware of where the money is going because you actually pay the entrepreneurs and they tell you what they're going to do with it. Uh, it's no harm, right? Because you're lending to people that need capital. It's impact because, you know, you're trying to support a local entrepreneur creating local economic activity or you're supporting a minority entrepreneur, um, you know, addressing the social inequality in this country. And it's regenerative because your expected return is negative. You're going to pay 15% to the platform. And then sometimes, you know, you might not see that back. So, you know, it's in between minus 100% and zero. So it's, it's uh, really in between, um, you know, investing and philanthropy. But I think a slice of our portfolio need to be there because that's what will rebuild 
the fertility of the soil, uh, the local economy, and so on. Uh, and you know, so it will have a slightly negative return or a large negative return. We don't know, but it's done, you know, with no, uh, not not with a financial motivation as you uh, do in the case of a charity donation. It, you're not thinking in in financial terms, but that could be transformative. Right. Well, as I think about it, you know, if if I agree with your analysis, the stock market may seriously tank just based on, and you, you have an article about this, the, the difference between the money world and the real world, where like the stock market is crazy high, at least it was last time I checked. And, you know, we've got unprecedented unemployment. We've got, you know, like the country's a mess, clearly. And the right. stock market reflects, you know, greater wealth for Jeff Bezos and, and Zuckerberg and the other, you know, mega billionaires. Um, that couldn't, in, like I was thinking, like if I invested all my money in Kiva and I got 97% of it back, I might do better there than in the stock market. That's a funny thing, but I'll, I'll give even a better example to your client, to your um, uh, viewers or people that are following your podcast. Uh, there is an impact investment I really like, which I think is very low risk and actually pays 2.75% per year. Now, they might reduce the, uh, the interest because the interest rates are coming down, but, you know, certainly above two. And it's called uh, C-Note. The website is mycnote.com. That's the letter C, by, right? Yeah, mycnote, C-N-O-T-E, M-Y-N-O, you know, C M Y C N O T dot com. And started by a friend of mine, Kat Berman, and what she noticed is that uh, CDFIs around the country, these are community development finance institutions, are basically institutions that are providing capital to people that have a really hard time accessing it. So people of color, uh, entrepreneurs, minority entrepreneurs, building, for example, low-income housing and stuff like that. They had difficulty accessing capital. And so she created a platform where she is raising funds from regular investors, and then she turns around and funds to CDFIs that are supporting, um, because of her interest, uh, women, minority women entrepreneurs. Hmm. So that is a, an impact investment that has, in my opinion, fairly low risk, pays at this point 2.75%, and it could, it, very, it could very well end up doing much better, even from a financial standpoint, than investing in the stock market now for the next 10 years. And again, uh, I'm not calling the direction of the market on the short term. Nobody knows you know, mm. what's going to happen. But all I'm saying is that if you look at the history, it has never happened that 10 years after the market was trading at 20, 21% PE, people got any money out of it. So... Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so there's another article that you, you wrote recently about making amends through re, what you call regenerative investing. And it gave me a whole new spin on the idea of reparations, right? Because when I think about reparations, I think about it very vaguely. I don't think about it in economic terms. It's just, oh, we did a bad thing and we got to make up for it somehow. But in your article, you kind of quantify a little bit like how much has been stolen, <laughs> from people of color going back centuries. Can you talk a little bit about, about that and your view and, and our responsibility yeah, I mean, to, to sure. rectify I mean, if, it? If you think about that, um, you know, capitalism really developed in the 17th and 18th century on the backs of slave labor. I mean, the slaves were the one doing most of the work. Uh, and that was, uh, again, either raising sugar cane in the uh, islands of the, uh, you know, Central America or uh, raising cotton in, uh, in the south of the United States. So imagine the situation where we take the labor for free from this population for years and years. And most of the wealth in this country originally, well, was built on stealing the land of the Native Americans and then bringing slave labor from Africa to work on the cotton plantation, mm. right? And after that, after we emancipated the, the slaves, uh, they had no money and they have no, you know, it's like, 
They had no resources. So this legacy translates into uh, the discrepancy in, in uh, median wealth across populations. And I showed you a chart in that, in that article. And I don't know if you can maybe put a link of my two yeah, articles so that you mentioned on will. your blog. But, uh, you know, the, the white population has a median uh, assets, you know, median wealth of about $140,000, something like that. And uh, people of black people uh, are close to zero. The median, which is half of the population has nothing to their name or almost nothing to their name. And this is really the legacy of the centuries during which the black people in this country were working for free for the white man. And after that, you know, we never did really reparation. So, you know, the affirmative action program, I'm very in favor of it because, you know, we're talking about centuries of disadvantages that need to be reversed. But more concretely, people need access to capital. And if you are, you know, you or I, you know, white dudes went to good schools, we might have a network of friends and then I'd be, you know, well off and we say, hey, I want to start something. You can find a friend that can write you a $5,000 check or $10,000, you know, it's not, uh, it's not hard to imagine, right? But for black people, they might not have a lot of friends well-connected uh, they can open their doors, they can write checks of a certain size and so on. And so even small amount of money can really make a difference. And that's why I like Kiva and what I've been doing since, you know, the killing of George Floyd is I've been investing in black entrepreneurs, providing them zero interest loans through Kiva Zip. And it seems to me the, you know, a direct way of trying to address this big historical injustice towards a slice of the population that has really been put down. Mm, yeah. And, you know, and just like for people who like, you know, for vegans who see animal cruelty and recognize it's going to take a while to change the world, but I can change my own relationship to it and I can make a difference as an individual and as part of a growing collective, we can do the same thing. We don't have to wait for everyone to become enlightened about the, the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow and inequality. We can actually take small steps that, that are kind of large. That's, you know, that yeah. $50, $100, $1,000 can make a huge difference because of this tremendous you know, historical wealth gap. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, here's the idea is that small steps uh, do a couple of things. One is make, make you feel better about yourself. Frankly, you know, we are dealing with a lot right now and it feels like the problems we're facing are almost so gigantic. You know, political system that's dysfunctional, COVID, you know, we can feel powerless and, uh, and worried. And what is the antidote to that is a sense of community and actions, right? If you can be in action and, and uh, feel the power of agency that you have and do it maybe as part of a group that can make you feel much better and what i'm saying is that you don't need to uh you know wait for the federal government to put together uh, a program of restitution to black people you can start your own you know take a couple hundred dollars and put them into kiva and give it to black entrepreneurs and by the way if you think that small actions do not amount to anything, think about the fact that when the Move Your Money campaign after the, the bank collapse of 2007, 2008, kind of the banks of the time wrecked the economy and then got, got built out. And now they're more powerful than, than ever, right? So people got really mad at that. And they said, take your money away from the big four banks. Well, they moved more than a trillion dollars worth of savings out of the main uh, four banks. And they basically injected that capital into uh, small regional banks and community uh, um, credit unions, which are the one doing the bulk of local lending. Guess what? Mm -hmm. The big banks are not interested in these small mom and pops businesses. They, they lend to large companies where they can do one deal and it's worth a lot, right? And so that task of moving, you know, your own checking account to 
uh, local credit union has spurred after 2008, 2009, a revival of local investing through the additional capital that those credit unions and local banks, banks received. And so, you know, we can have collectively a large impact. And I would say the, the Kiva Zip idea and looking at black entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs of color, it's something that could make a difference. Mm. Okay. So I want to kind of, um, close by talking about the thing that you first brought up in the webinar, which really shook me because I, I live on a beautiful road. It's, um, it's, it's pastures and, and woods. And one of my neighbors, I don't know exactly, I don't know who it is, um, cut, had 50 acres of pine cut down and really sort of just sort of, you know, slash and haul away. And it's just, you know, it's a tangled mess now. And it was this beautiful, you know, forest that I would drive by. And now it's, it's this scar. And you showed some, ex some images in the, in the webinar of, of exactly that thing. So it really hit me hard. And, you know, your point was that the, the, the financial system is based on basically extracting from the earth without giving anything back. Um, can you kind of go over that a little bit? Because I think it's, it sort of forms the basis. Like we wonder like why the system is broken. It's a couple of like core assumptions about externalities and about what the earth is worth that kind of underpin everything. Can you kind of go over that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, nature provides a lot to us and does not charge us, right? Provides fresh air, clean air to breathe, provides pollination services, provides fertility in the soil. I mean, it's amazing. Provides wood. I mean, in the forest, you can, right? And we're not charged for it. But, so therefore, someone who can take that without, without you know, worrying about the consequences uh, is poised to make money. And to a certain extent, uh, if you look at that piece of land, right, uh, that your neighbor kind of destroyed, it was providing ecosystem services, not only to him, but to you, right? Water purification trees put out, oxygen take in, CO2, uh, was a habitat for many species. And that particular piece of ecosystem uh, was built over centuries by nature and would have been around for centuries if this guy had not taken it down. And so this idea of, you know, we need to look at the, what nature provides for us and steward it because it's totally unfair to privatize a common that nature built over hundreds or sometimes thousands of years and destroy it just for the economic benefit of one person or a small group. But that's what finance does. If you look at finance, and, a, and a finance looks at a, at a forest and says, great, if we can buy this for $10 million so we can sell the wood for $12 million, it's a 20% return. Let's go for it, right? And, and in fact, it was a study by the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity. is a UN group that in 2013 published a, a study called uh, um, Nature, um, let's see, Natural Capital at Risk, the Top 100 Externalities of Business. And what they did is they used kind of a environmental economics techniques to put a price tag on what nature was providing to us for free or put a price tag on pollution because we pollute the air and the land and so on. And what they found out is that collectively as humans in 2009 used more than $7 trillion worth of natural capital to generate our economic activity which at the time was worth about $70 trillion. So we are subsidizing our economic activity. And at the end of the day, our financial returns through the destruction of the natural system, we're treating nature as a business in liquidation and you're converting that into economic growth and financial returns. You know, if you look at the big picture, that's basically what's happening. And so, you know, we really had to stop doing that because our survival depends on maintaining a viable global ecosystem. And you're already seeing signs that we're really in trouble. Like there's a heat wave right now in Siberia uh, and the permafrost is, is melting at a really rapid rate. Uh, temperatures in Baghdad last week were 125 degrees. 
you know, unheard of, large parts of the Middle East will become inhabitable if this continues. So we, this is real and we have to pay attention. So talk a little bit about the course that, that uh, you'll be offering next month. What, are, what, who should sign up for it? What are they going to learn? What will they be able to do? And right. So this is called Towards Aware and uh, um, No Harm Investing. And they will learn, and I can send you the link to the description, but uh, I developed this over time and I was teaching this to financial advisors last year. And, I, and you know, one of them even changed her business model to implement fully No Harm Investing. So even a financial advisors can do that. So this is open to, this time around is focused on, on individual investors, but financial advisors are welcome to join us if they want, or you know, small family foundations. And it's really a, a learning experience to understand some of the problems we talked about here, right? So what it's happening right now to the natural environment, connecting that to the investments we make, the importance of becoming aware of what our investments are doing, what are the techniques to do that? And also, you know, what are the things you care about? Because at the end of the day, if you want to shift your investments, you need to be clear about what are the things you care about and what are the things you don't want to participate in with your investments. And this will then guide the, the effort to move your money in the right direction. And, uh, you know, to do that prudently, right? We're not talking about doing crazy stuff and, uh, and endanger your financial security, but it's, you know, uh, there are options out there. We'll discuss a number of, uh, of um, impact investment options, some regenerative investment option, uh, and some no harm investment options uh, for people that want to do that. Now, you know, obviously not everybody might want to take control of their entire portfolio, but they might be able to do that with a little slice of their portfolio. And it's, a, it's the beginning of a journey and can be done with really an amazing group of people. And if, if you're joining us, I mean, who wouldn't want to be with Howard Jacobson? Yeah? <laughs> I mean, imagine spending part of September with me and Howard and other people like that. They're really motivated to become aware of what their investments are doing and exploring options uh, to move in a better direction. Yeah, just being on the webinar that you held last week, there was a, an advi an econo a financial advisor who was on the call. I was thinking, um, you know, got kind of like um, networking with him to say, hey, maybe you want to help me do this. Right. And he will be actually attending the course. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, I mean, it just, just having a network just makes me feel less crazy. Just right. like for a lot of people, when they go plant-based, they stop eating meat and everybody around them all of a sudden becomes an expert on nutrition, telling right. them that they're, <laughs> you know, they're going to die of poison of, of, um, right. of protein deficiency. Just, you know, we have to find people like, you know, so if you're sort of a, a, a convener of the movement and a thought right. leader, we've got to find people who believe in the same things we believe. Otherwise, we're just going to become undermined and, right. and give up. Well, the other thing is, you know, the, we are doing something that the system doesn't want us to do. The system is set up to perpetuate itself. The problem is that we're all going to die in the process. So we'll have to change course eventually, <laughs> hopefully sooner rather than later, but it's not easy. And so it's, it's great to surround yourself with a group of people that are willing to take on this challenge and support each other in the process. Right. So um, give us the website where people can go. I'll also include it in the show notes, but a lot of people just listen. So they'll, this is the way they'll find it. Yeah. So if they go to uh, my website, which is ek4t.com, that stands for Essential Knowledge for Transition. Okay, four number, is the number. number four. Ek yeah. number four. Ek T. number four t.com. Okay. And then if, uh, you know, the top menu has what we do. And the first one is courses. And if they just click on that, they'll go directly to the description of the course. So it's ek4g.com, what do we do, courses. And uh, I will create a discount for your group uh, so awesome. that they can uh, attend for 20% off. And let's say it will expire in uh, whatever, the, uh, about the 15th of August or something like that. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Yep, I'll definitely get that out. Well, well before then, I'll get it out over a week before then. Great. Thank Excellent. you. And and to be clear, um, I don't get any money. For, uh, it's not an affiliate code, so I don't get paid. So I'm just I'm recommending this because I'm doing it, and I think the world needs it. 
Wonderful. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for having me and um, for allowing me to present this. Yeah. And, you know, and also to be clear, like there's so much sort of hanky panky in the financial industry. You're not a broker or an advisor. You don't make money on people moving their money anywhere. Right. You're just you're an educator the way I am. I, I am an educator. Yes. And I don't manage uh, people's money. That's true. So I my main effort is to educate people on how to do that. Yes. So great. Um, so, so, uh, sort of last, uh, last couple of questions. Um, do you have any thoughts on like where, where things are going from a policy perspective? Like, is this movement growing to the point where it's going to make a difference? Um, cause you know, you mentioned, you've talked about like $2 trillion, $1 trillion. And if I've got, you know, 12,000, it feels like very little. And I know I can, you know, have some agency and connect with like-minded people, but do you see any sort of reasons for optimism looking forward? Well, uh, people say if you look at the facts, uh, it's hard not to be pessimist. And if you look at the actions that people are taking and the possibilities of transforming the place we live in, you can not be optimist. So I still am an optimist. I understand that changing the financial system is going to be really hard. Uh, and uh, uh, that's why you know, I was teaching about the money system and the Federal Reserve. I mean, if we were to run the Federal Reserve for the interest of everybody in this country, it would do something completely different than it's doing now. It has tremendous power to create money. And if we were to create that to improve the infrastructures and to fund uh, loans to small businesses, as it was designed, by the way, in uh, 1913 when it was enacted you know we would be much better off and we wouldn't have this big discrepancy between the have and the have nots so that's uh, a bigger compensation and hopefully if we change this uh, congress in november you know we might have the ability to implement some of those institutional changes we need but we don't need to wait for that to start making changes ourselves awesome awesome F final question um I like to ask people what music they're listening to that other people might not know about. you have any favorite bands, songs, genres that you like? You know, it's funny. I, uh, I listen to Bach and I play Bach. I, I don't know what to say. It just uh, takes me to a different uh, space. And I don't know if you saw 2001 uh, uh, Space Odyssey when yeah. the guy was left alone, you know, shooting in the outer space in his... Uh, uh, capsule. What? Mm -hmm. What did he end up listening to? Bach. Bach. All right. You got a, a particular um, KWV? Uh, <laughs> well, um, I do Pandora, so I, I listen. Uh -huh. I listen that way, and uh, I'm working right now really hard on a fugue of the Walt temp Tempered Clavier, and oh, it's okay. uh, it's really challenging for me. But so, it's so keeping play, me busy. You play piano. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you hum while you play? No, no. but okay. I hum after I play and my partner <laughs> is very upset by that. I'm All done. right. Yeah, I was, I was fiddling around with uh, one of the two part inventions yesterday. I, I can only play with one hand at a time. But, uh, oh, the two parts is wonderful. Yeah, I love that. My, number eight was my favorite. Oh, I don't Pretty remember fun. the number. This one was da 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 Good. I'll, we'll, we'll get people listening to some Bach. Maybe it'll, uh, it'll, it'll um, engender more rationality. It will calm their nerves. <laughs> awesome. Marco Evangelisti, thank you so much. Thank you for everything you do, for all you've taught me and awakened me to. Thank you for the course you're teaching and the generous offer of uh, the 20% discount. Um, how do they get that discount? Uh, so it, when they register for the course, uh, on my website, they click on uh, become a member, mm -hmm. and then they select the, the uh, Towards Aware and No Harm Investing membership, and then they just enter the discount code, code PLANT. PLANT. So the first yeah. word of plant yourself. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to learning from you about how to use my money to make a better world. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Okay. Take care. Bye.